all so much for joining me. I have a very special guest with me. He is a 21st century leader, a preacher, pastor at Straight Gate International Church here in Detroit, a father, husband, and son of a man who I've admired and respected deeply for so many years. Please help me welcome Pastor Jonathan Andrew Merritt. Pastor How you Merritt, doing? Good, to see you, good to see you. Man, we got so much to talk about. Do we? Um, <laughs> we are in the sanctuary. First of all, we're in this beautiful edifice, and, and this sanctuary is, it means a lot to me, and I can only imagine what it means to you being yeah. the son of the bishop here. Um, I remember in the late 80s, early 90s, coming here, and a young lady by the name of Dana Powell. Wow. Uh, wow, you went back. Yes, she was <laughs> in my inspiration when, wow. when I started my praise and worship ministry. Wow. I'm like, I just wow. loved how she ministered and flowed with the word and the music. So I just come in the sanctuary for a minute when we were um, waiting to get started here. I just sat here like, wow, just, and not even that, just the men and women of God who stood on this pulpit and, and preached and ministered. It's amazing. I'm just curious. Uh, being the son of this house, yeah. what does it mean to you coming and just seeing what... I mean, there's, there's rich history. I mean, last year we celebrated 40 years of ministry. Uh, my dad founded this ministry, Straight Gate, uh, 40 years ago with my mom and my oldest sister. Um, so the three of them opened the storefront, uh, didn't have any money, didn't have any marketing dollars, and it was just them that opened the doors because my dad believed that God had called him. Uh, to start it, and uh, that, you know, through the years, uh, God has just been faithful. Um, and that's really what it all, it's all comes down to, is that God, whatever God touches and he, you know, gives direction on and gives you the vision for, you know, he'll make sure he sees it to come to pass as long as you follow along uh, with that vision. So men and women have graced this stage, graced this platform, uh, the members, the, the, the people of God, the men and women of God uh, who sang, who preached, uh, who taught, um, I mean, it's just, uh, it's a blessing. So when you come in here, I, I look around and I'm like, man, this is just a, a beauty of God's wisdom. Mm -hmm. You mentioned your dad, the founding pastor, uh, along with your mom, Bishop Andrew Mayer. I did not know until recently, uh, first of all, you look just like him. <laughs> um, your pastor, you got his middle name. Yeah. Well, you have his first name, is your middle yeah. name. But you share his birthday. Yeah. And yeah. he prophesied, he, Your prophesied, birth. he prophesied my birth, and uh, back then, in 82, don't want to tell my age, but, <laughs> you know, y'all can do the math, um, but uh, back in 82, you couldn't tell whether or not a woman was going to have a, a boy or a girl, so my dad had previously had three girls, so many people were like, uh, you're about to have another girl, look at the way that the belly shaped uh -huh. it, they came up with all these reasons why uh, there was going to be another girl, but... Um, he believed God, that God had promised him a son, and so uh, he went out there boldly on faith and said, uh, you can have what you say. So he prophesied that not only was he going to have a boy, but that he, I was going to be born on his birthday. So my due date was like in December, so it was like eight days off from his birthday. Um, so it wasn't like it was, you know, I was supposed to be due on that day. Um, but I happened to be born on a Sunday morning which was wild because I was born at like 7.30 and then he left her at the hospital to go preach. Wow. And to declare. <laughs> I think he probably had a little bit of pride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had some pride running in. He, that he couldn't wait to tell everybody. To tell everybody. <laughs> Look, I told you, but the title of that message was You Can Have What You Say. Wow. So it was kind of cool because I, um, a couple years ago, I, I preached What You Can Have, you can have What You Say part two. Mm -hmm. So um, because I was believing God for a boy as well and I had two girls. And so people were like, oh, you're going to have another girl. And so it's like people in your own church, like, why are you going against me? Let's Where's go. your faith Where's in your God? Faith <laughs> Any faith in the house? Right, um, right. Uh, so uh, it was tremendous, um, just this tremendous lineage to be a part of this family. Absolutely. 40 years in ministry. Uh, your dad and this church has been a pinnacle in the city for many years. You now being a pastor, along with your brother. Yeah. Uh, what does that feel like? Uh, it's yeah. amazing to work with your family. You know, a lot of people uh, say that it's terrible, it's hard working with your family. I mean, I work with my sisters, I work with my brother, I work with my wife who works here at the church. So we all here as a family work together and it's a blessing. Uh, my dad always says is he believes that when God calls a man, he calls a family. Um, mm -hmm. Not that necessarily everybody has to work in that field, but being a part of that vision and sharing a part and, and, and making them along and taking them along for the experience, uh, it's been such a blessing. Uh, especially my brother, because when we were younger, uh, we were not the closest brothers. We were not the ones that you sit there and say, oh, I want a relationship like them two. No, 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 that wasn't the case. Um, but as time went on, when we had both, when he had got to Michigan, he's 
three years younger than me when he had got to Michigan and we were uh, both on campus, he decided not to stay with me mm. and decided to stay with one of my friends on a futon when I had a whole nother bedroom uh, open. Go prove to you, yeah, I, I got this. Prove to me, like, I got this, but it, it proved to me that I needed to do some work on our relationship. Uh, so uh, I took it upon myself to go to his dorm room. I mean, his not dorm, but his apartment every single day. And we watched sports together, mm. which kind of like the thing that we had in common uh, of our interests. So uh, that just started our relationship. And now um, the bond is there. The bond is yes, stronger yes. than ever. I'm his biggest supporter, and he's my biggest supporter. Wow. That is amazing. I have many, many friends who are PKs of prominent mm -hmm. ministers. I'm just curious because I know it can be tough sometimes, especially yeah. growing up in ministry. Yeah. Um, being the kid of the preacher or the bishop, you can carry sometimes the weight of the burden. Yeah. Had that been your experience? Yeah, so all? it's one of the reasons why I didn't want to do this. Um, matter of fact, if I can get out of it right now, the second during this podcast, <laughs> I, I, let me go do something different. It's a lot. You know, it's a lot taking on... Um, you know, people's lives and being held accountable to God. It's not just accountable to man, you're accountable to God uh, when you're a pastor. And so uh, just seeing that as I grew up, just the demand on my dad of uh, people's family being in the hospital, marriage, uh, marriage problems, uh, family issues, uh, people losing people in their family, bereavement issues. So uh, just all of it. I didn't want to be part of it. For me, it was just like, this is what my dad does, not what I have to do. Um, but yet you had people all along saying that, no, you, you're going to be a pastor. You're going to, you know, it's whatever PK gets, right? You know, you're going to be a pastor. And like, no, I'm going to do my own thing. And I tried to do my own thing. My brother tried to do his own thing. And uh, that's one thing about I love about God is that sometimes in life, your gifting is not necessarily what he has for you and I, and, I, and it's kind of hard to like realize that like because I was a basketball player that's what I was good at that's what I wanted to be my brother the exact same way so we both played in college and um, unfortunately I had some uh, injuries in my shoulder that kind of like put a halt to those things but you know you realize I had a gift in my whole life um, and to see it go away and realize that my future was not dependent upon my gift Speaking of uh, your gifting, and we want to definitely tap into your book, Step Out, um, by Jonathan Merritt. And this book begins with a trip, and I think you alluded to it a little bit, um, that you had with your wife in Costa Rica. Okay. Yeah. Start us there and tell us what yeah, happened. Yeah, it, it was a crazy situation. Um, we're on a vacation. We have four kids. At that time, we only had three. And just to get away, spend some time, you know, one of the things that I realized uh, being a part of my family is that I always felt like my dad never got away enough. And still to this day, he doesn't get away <laughs> enough. I mean, I, he absolutely loves what he does. I, I mean, my dad can run circles around all of us. Wow. I mean, that's how much he loves pastoring. He loves working for the ministry. He loves doing the things of God. But at some point, you got to realize, hey, you need some time away to recharge. So we took out some time to recharge and went out there for a week or we were planning to and having just enjoy each other. And we get to Costa Rica. First night's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And the second night, uh, we're coming back from the beach to the hotel and just a freak accident. You know, we were in a golf cart. Not, I wasn't driving. When I, was there, <laughs> I, I was not driving. Um, but they were driving and all of a sudden, uh, he stops the golf cart sprinkler system is like going around us so he didn't want it to hit us so he kind of like backed up a little bit and once the speaker uh, sprinkler system starts going the opposite direction he presses the gas a little bit too hard I end up me and my wife were on the back side of the golf cart ended up falling backwards on this uh, on this hill and uh, you know it was just crazy um, and I didn't really know what was going on at the time um, my wife was like far from me. She wasn't like right next to me. We fell out. She went her way. I went my way. And it was pitch black. And an SUV, uh, I could see the, I could remember seeing the lights as it was approaching. But since it was pitch black, like they couldn't necessarily see us. And my wife like screams, no. That's all I, that's all I can remember. And the SUV swerved. And so it was just a crazy experience. I could barely walk. My elbow was busted all the way open. I couldn't move my arm really. Um, it was just a cr 
crazy experience that we had. Uh, was in the hospital and um, you know for the rest of my time there uh, with the doctor seeing me in the room and you know shooting me up with different things, uh, uh, taking opiate pills to deal with the pain, and so. Um, it was probably the, one of the most craziest experiences in my life. But one of the things about it is, is that's why I believe that God um, knows these things are going to happen, right? He, he's, he's seen them happen already, but yet he knows that way of escape. And uh, we just got to yeah. find that way out. Yeah. So that's what you know, set up the book. It starts there, and, and I want to dig a little deeper into that. You talk about that experience. I'm wondering, that experience, did it in your mind bring a halt to all of your vision goals? Because prior to yeah. that, you still wanted to do the basketball thing. No, 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 so this is, so that was, so I, I took my rotator cuff in my shoulder a couple of times in college. Okay. This accident, so I've been out of college for quite some time. <laughs> this this accident happened in January of 2018. Okay. So, um, you know, married, three kids. Um, I get back to Detroit. Um, and really can't function as a husband, pastor. Uh, you know, I own a coffee shop, couldn't, couldn't do anything mm-hmm. with that. I was basically in the bed and then going to my appointments, my doctor appointments. Um, that was pretty much a seven week period of my life. Wow. So it did put a halt to all those different things because I couldn't really function. Wow, wow. Yeah. Your dad opens up in his foreword and I think he had uh, a great perspective of his position mm-hmm. of this experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, somehow he found out that you were dead. It's, no, so and, and this, is, know, this, is cra- this is crazy. It's one of the most craziest things ever. Okay. I was on a trip two months before the Costa Rica trip. Okay, hold on. So something else happened. Something else. No, nothing happened on the trip. Okay. But somebody with my name passed away in the Caribbean. So I was on a way on a trip, so, and somebody called my dad, like, I'm sorry. And he's like, what are you sorry for? It's like, oh, you, you heard, right? And he's like, what? And he was like, oh, Bishop, you haven't heard? He's like, no. I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, Bishop. I don't know if I'm out of line by saying this, but Jonathan's gone. Cause somebody with my name actually did pass. That's in the crazy. Caribbean, so they thought that it was me because I was actually on a trip. Hold on, hold on. So we got. So that was a couple of months prior, prior to, this to this accident. So spiritually, do you feel like there was some kind of attack that the enemy oh, made? Oh man, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. The enemy does not want anything to go forward, and if he feels like something is going to go forward, and he could put a halt to it. He'll do every single thing possible. I mean, he came to Jesus. Jesus gives him the word. And it says, the Bible says that he, he was said that he would come back at another opportune time. So he will continuously come back to try to poke holes, to halt, to stop what God is doing. Um, because he knows when God's hand is on somebody's life. And um, so I, I just looked at it as, you know, my dad kept on calling my cell phone, but I was actually in the spot. So he was determined, and he writes this in the forward, he was determined to hear my voice like, no, 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 my son is not dead. Why? Because the promises of God, they can't die. So he just kept staying on that, called my phone so many times, and he called David. Finally, I get out of the, out of the spot. I'm like, why is my phone being lit up? And then I end up calling my dad, and my dad tells me what had took place. But, I mean, he was so full of emotion on that phone call that, you know, after somebody that said that just to hear my voice again. So this happens two months later after that situation. So it, it, we knew for a fact that this is the enemy just, you know, trying to do what he does. I want to read something uh, Bishop Merritt wrote in his forward and get your perspective as okay. a believer. He said, my son has become the subject of many of my messages over the years, including you can have what you say and faith extended. Mm-hmm. He is the promise of God fulfilled to me. Mm-hmm. So I kept calling his phone. Mm-hmm. You must be thinking, why call a child that you were told was dead? And he makes this profound statement. Because promises don't die. As a believer, what does that, that statement alone mean to you? Uh, that statement alone to me means that he knew for a fact that the plan of God for my life, that wouldn't 
And if that, and if, and if just like Isaac with Abraham, it says that Abraham knew that God was able, even him going through with killing of Isaac, was able to resurrect him. And that same promise that he knew that God had given him about my life. Um, a couple days later after I was born, Kenneth Copeland um, dedicates me at Copeland Hall um, in front of like 13,000 people. Um, five days old. Yeah, my mom didn't even want me to leave the hospital <laughs> at that time, let alone be yeah. amongst 13,000 people yeah. at five days old. Um, you know, that, that's you know, I'm barely here a couple a hundred hours, right, you know, a hundred right. something hours here on this earth. Um, so uh, she finally uh, submits and allows that to happen. But one of the prayers in that um, that kid from prayed over me is that that I would be uh, a pastor to the millennials, and that's back in '82. So the word millennial wasn't even really mm-hmm. college in college. So if that vision of every single thing in my life um, prophetically was to be fulfilled, then that promise did not. That is amazing. There are a few other points, as you can see, my book is lit up. I, oh, I, thanks so much for reading. It. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. A few other things I want to uh, touch bases on, just to get your perspective yeah. as the author. You talk about the man on the pool side, mm-hmm. um, and you say the man on the pool by the pool could have been healed a long time ago. Then his words hit me. He said, "You said he was stuck in his mind, which is why he stayed trapped in his body." Your book, Step Out, is talking about stepping out on faith in the promises of God. But there are so many in the gen- this generation, even yeah. generations prior, who right. are stuck yeah. in their mind. Yeah. Um, how do they overcome that process? Uh, uh, I talk about it in my book. It, it's, it's a process, right? Like, so even if you look at the man at, uh, at the gate, at the pool, at the, uh, the woman with the issue of blood, there was a moment that took place that they understood in order to receive from God, they had to act on faith. There was a stepping out that needed to be done in order to receive. Now, here he is waiting for somebody to put him in the pool after 30 something, like why not just scoot a little bit closer Mm -hmm. so you can just fall right in. Mm -hmm. But he thought to himself that he needed the assistance in order to make that work. And that's what a lot of us look for is assistance in other places. But when we have Christ on the inside of us, Christ is not, we should be waiting on him. He's waiting on us to step out. And so a lot of us get stuck for put these things in our mind. Well, I can't be healed until I get to the doctor. I can't be healed or I can't receive anything until I get a promotion. uh, We're always looking and, and, and kind of minimizing and limiting God for what he's able to do. When he says, if you, should, if you believe, you shall see the glory of God, the problem is the believing part. Most of us don't believe. We can say something and not believe it. And the problem is with that is that if I am saying things that I don't believe or I'm asking things or praying things, Mark 11, 23, 24, it's not, I'm, I can't receive from it. I gotta believe. To believe something means to take action. And if I believe something, I shall see the fruit of something. The fruit being fruitful, uh, we look at, you know, talking about dominion and we talk about the Bible for a second. To be fruitful means to exhibit to the public. That means that there is exhibiting. That means that there is something that is indicating that something has been fulfilled already. Well, if I believe something in faith, faith is the substance of what things hope for, the evidence. There is no evidence. So I'm acting out on something that cannot be seen in this world yet, but it is seen to God before he called me before the foundations of the world. Thy will be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. If that's the case, and I'm supposed to receive things from heaven, he says the things that are on this earth are temporary. The things in heaven are eternal. So I have to continuously speak out and understand that when I speak, and if I keep on speaking, that's what the woman's issue of blood, she's able to receive from God her healing because I guarantee you, as she got closer and closer, if I can just get there. Yeah. Now you talk about believing, um, even when you don't see yeah. what faith is. I'm curious, with in this generation, mm-hmm. social media, everything mm-hmm. is visual, everything right. is an image. Right. How can we embrace the unseen 
when everything is evident. Because we gotta do what we gotta do the same thing Abraham did. Abraham talks to God. He's not talking to anybody else. That's why God wanted him away from the family, away from what he knew to be true. He had to take him out of that environment and get him in a place where only he could deal with him. That's why it's important for us, even in this generation, to spend time with God. Yeah. Get into that secret place, get into that prayer closet, even if it's in your car, even if it's a little uh, in your cubicle at your job during your break, spend time with God. Because as you spend time with God, then he's able to show Abraham his vision and says, Abraham, look at the stars. Look at the same. They're innumerable, right? So that's how, that's how your seed is going to be. He's able to now give him a vision. Now, once he has become in a place where it's only him and God. And us as young people, uh, we in this generation, we have to take that same uh, experience and say, you know what? Instead of me spending all this time on social media, because I'm seeing all these different images and majority of them ain't glorifying God, let me get into my Bible. And that's one of the things that I try to tell people is that, you know, also for this generation, you know, the Bible app, it's a wonderful app. I use it all the time. I use it for studying. I use it for when I preach. But there's something about getting yeah. that written word of God out that the only notification that you can get is from the Holy Spirit. Yeah. It ain't no, ain't, I'm getting notifications from Twitter, IG, Snap, <laughs> right. and all these other places, you know, mm -hmm. my messages or my phone calls to interrupt that time. If I put those things away during that time with God, I can hear clearly so that the vision that I'm getting is from Him, and then I know that He's got to make that thing come to pass. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. Let's talk vision for a minute, because yeah. not only are you a man of God preacher, but you're also a business owner. Yeah. Um, how does that translate for you? It's great. Um, I own a coffee shop, me and my brother, and we never drink coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so no, that, no Starbucks? No. <laughs> that just goes to show you that God can do anything. One of the things about it is that our bookstore here at Straight Gate, um, you know, book sales has been declining for years. Um, seeing the uh, insurgence of technology and iPads, iPhones, Kindles, uh, ebook readers. And so what happened was we were saying, what do we do with this space? How can we uh, revamp this space and still build community? So we said a coffee shop, we should do that. and be able to give people a chance to sit down, drink coffee, spend time together with one another and create an incredible experience. But we didn't know anything about coffee. But uh, my brother David has some contacts with uh, Zingerman's in Ann Arbor. And uh, we met with them and sat down with them and they taught us basically the coffee business from A to Z. And uh, so we opened one here in April of 2016. Uh, after the first day, we knew we had something special because yeah. people were just loving every single thing from the drinks to the uh, baked goods to the smoothies, coffee, the whole nine yards. And so uh, we knew that we had something. So have, uh, you, have you tried a little bit yet? Oh, I, I drink. I drink. I drink our stuff. You drink it. OK. <laughs> <laughs> you got to proof it first. Yeah, okay. We drink our stuff. So that was that one. And then uh, probably a couple months later, my brother was at Cuzzo's off of Livernois. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, eating some good chicken and waffles. And then all of a sudden, he walked by the building next door and saw that it was available for lease. And so, uh, you know, we asked God, God, this is what you want us to do. Set forward. And uh, we've been open now for a little bit over two years. Wow. Well, I, I, I want to dig into the, your entrepreneurial ventures cool. for a second because cool. they're, entrepreneurial is something, entrepreneurship now is something that everybody is aspiring yeah. to be. They yeah. don't really know. It yeah. takes a whole I'll lot add, more than they I'll realize. Add. Uh, but give us some nuggets, some things that you hold on to as it pertains to the daily grind. The daily grind. Daily, of daily Monday through Sunday. <laughs> and you're a preacher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, I would say this is your team is, your team, I uh, actually uh, watch a show uh, pretty religiously. It's called The Prophet. Yes. Um, yes, yes. Uh, with Marcus Lavoni. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, people, process, and products. And so we kind of follow the same uh sentiment of saying that uh, the pe your people are everything. And we wanted to create a customer uh, service that was unmatched on that street and really unmatched across coffee shops that we had ever been to. Uh, so we wanted to make sure that you were greeted when you were in, when people came in and you were greeted when you were left and uh, that your needs were met while you were there. That same kind of thought process that we have here at Straight Gate, that all the people's needs would be met any way that we can help make that happen. Um, so we kind of gave that, um, our brand, that kind of, you know, vibe. Mm -hmm. And so um, investing in your people 
you'll never go wrong. Because if you invest in your employees, your customers are going to feel that. They're going to see that. Because if you don't, they're going to see the opposite. You know, people who don't care about, uh, you know, whether or not you're, you get the greatest customer service right, experience right. or not. Um, so investing in your people is always most important. Um, the product has to be obviously incredible. Yes. I think the product makes the difference. So yes, you can have the best people, but if you don't have a product that can separate or you can market it as something that is different um, than your competitors, then I think you're not gonna have a, a really good chance of being successful. So, um, and obviously the process. The more efficient you can make something, the better it is that your business is going to be. So we try to, every single week, we uh, meet at nine o'clock and try to go over what is happening and go over how we can correct different things and put a process in place and keep on changing up the process and keep on changing yeah. it and changing it and changing it until uh, it, it becomes, it probably won't ever stop changing, yeah. right? Yeah. That's the whole thing Don't about it is that, because you want to always continue to get better and better. That's right. Uh, what are you doing in those moments when you have the vision, everybody's rolled out, the team is rah, rah, mm -hmm. rah, and it doesn't go as planned, and now yeah. it's this and that. We're dealing with that right. We're dealing with that right now on our block um, on Livernois. There's uh, construction going since May first, and it um, won't end until next year, probably. Well, we, <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we rebuked that in Jesus' name. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't want that to happen. But one of the things that I'll say is that we've been dealing with this issue of construction on the block, so it, it made us really adjust our thinking of how to bring revenue dollars in during this time where it's a hard time for people not being able to park on the street or being able to open our front door. Um, and so uh, we've had to adjust our, our, our thinking about the process that we were going underneath and um, saying what other avenues or other ways can we create growth strategies in order to still bring in dollars for the business. So uh, we're hit with that construction every single day um, over the last five months. Um, and we'll see how long it continues, but prayerfully. Bringing a close, bringing a halt to it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Hear it no further. Look, you go old school. <laughs> wow. Team building. I, I want to tap into that really quick. Um, for an individual that's looking uh -huh. to step out in a vision, they know they can't do it alone. Yeah. What would you say their first steps should be to build that mm. team? So I think it's even if you can't hire somebody, yeah. talk to you, find a mentor, find somebody in the same field, even if it's cold calling, cold emailing, um, you never know what could happen. Yeah. My brother actually is like, he's like the best cold emailer off of LinkedIn <laughs> that there ever was. Um, but he's, it, it, that's what I'm saying. In order for there to be a reaction in heaven, there's gotta be an action here on earth. So you gotta step out and do something. Find somebody that is in the same field that you can learn from, that you can grow from, because you don't know what kind of contacts or connections that they can give you uh, to help you go, for, go forward um, on that vision. Another thing that you can do, obviously, is sometimes even with a lot of entrepreneurs, or you're starting by yourself, it's just you. Um, so that means that you are the CEO, you are the G general manager, you're the CFO, yeah. you're, you're all these different things. Looking um, at the SBDC or the SBA and trying to find different resources within your city, uh, within you know your county, and try to find out what free resources that you can get um, or be a part of. Another thing is networking. Try you know Facebook groups and see what along um, your path or your vision that you could be a part of to be a part of a community that people are in a like mind, yeah. same street, same yeah. same environment. So, yeah, so yeah. good. Uh, back to your book, the reference. You talk about stepping out. I'm curious, um, how does an individual know when they should not be stepping out on a particular thing? <laughs> Whether or not God tells you. Oh. If any step that you are taking that he didn't tell you to take is a wrong step. It's a misstep. Mm -hmm. Sometimes not moving is still stepping out. Mm. And people got to remember that. That's good. Because a lot of people think, I, you know, okay, John, you're telling me to step out. Okay, let me step out on something that I've been wanting to do. I've been believing that this is the call for my life. I've been thinking about this. Where, you know, sometimes throughout this time that we've been sitting together, I've been feeling cold. At some moments, I've been feeling kind of warm. So that stepping out can change, you know, on the whim. But if, I, if I'm not 
hearing the voice of God in something, it's not going to prosper me anyway. So sometimes waiting on God is still stepping out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he answers a couple of different ways. He gives us clear yes. He gives us a clear no. And then sometimes he doesn't say anything at all. And when he doesn't say anything at all, that's still warning that maybe it's not for you right now, but that still isn't a guess. So that's still for that time period is no until he gives you the direction uh, to say yes. Jesus was so efficient on the earth because he only said what God said and only did what God did. That's the reason why he was able to receive every single thing and knock off every single part of that vision that God, the Father, um, and the Holy Spirit had set up for them to orchestrate them. Wow, wow. That is amazing. I, I want to touch on that just a little bit more because there are so many people who hear this, um, listen to God, if he tells you yes, yeah, yeah. but then you yeah. have that whole group that they don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to for. do. Right. How do they train their ear or their spirit? Train your ear is um, get into church. You know, I, I, I have this thing with our age group that love Bedside Baptist. And they might say that they're not a part of Bedside Baptist. They might say they are a part of a, a local assembly. Uh, but you got to get out of your bed. And there's something important about being around like believers that, you know, you can grow from being a part of a church that you can be a part of and learning the voice of God through whoever your pastor is and um, whoever the leaders are at that church to help lead you and guide you. I'm a huge, huge proponent on we can't be uh, a YouTube, uh, a YouTube gospel yes. because what happens is it's great as sermons and things that are on there and I obviously we use it we I mean I love it as a medium as a tool but I, if I'm not a part of uh, a local body there there's it's hard for me and God and Jesus knew that like if 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 you're not a part of of a gathering when you need support of community you'll always miss that yeah. being part of YouTube gospel why because you're, you're part of a church that doesn't meet, doesn't, you know, doesn't talk your to one number. another. They don't even know your name. They don't even know your name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how can people be praying for you mm -hmm. and standing in the gap for you and being an example to you? And um, so I would say being a part of a local assembly, spending, and it's not so much about, oh, I'm trying to get them into a church. The Bible tells us the importance of why to be inside of a church. Um, but I'll talk about just spending time with God. And the more that you read his word, just ask him. One of the great things about my father is that he got saved and filled with the spirit just by being at his house. You know, he was a, he was a person of just one person just spending time with God and God just blessed him. And then that same, being in that same room, gave him the vision to straight day. I mean, it's just amazing that if you spend time with him, and I said it, it would be like ignorant of me to ask you a question right now. And even if you didn't answer me, but just walk right off the stage mm. as I asked it. Mm, and sometimes good. when we're praying to God, we, okay, Lord, this is what I want. This is what I need, Lord. We could be even full of tears and whatnot. And then the next moment, okay, let me go check my phone. So it's important that, like, give God time to answer you. Just don't give him the three minutes or two minutes, you know, out of your day and say, oh, well, God hasn't answered me yet. I think some of them don't even believe he will. Right. Because they haven't had that personal touch, so or, they, they're even questioning. Or, or they believe what they've done in their life has made them, uh, in that, you know, to feel this. Uh, not as qualified to. Not as qualified yeah, to be, yeah. to, to, to receive from God. Wow. wow. But God's grace is sufficient. Period. <laughs> Period. Yep. That sufficient means no matter what I've done, my God's grace is sufficient that he's already forgiven me on the cross. So I have access to that by coming to the Father and just you know, getting back in line and step of what he wants from me. You talk about that experience with um, Bishop asking you to preach. Yeah. What, was, what do you think he was doing? He wanted me to step out. He's like, you can receive, that's the part about receiving your healing. The woman with the issue of blood for 12 long years, she went to all these different other sources, but really the only source that she needed was Christ. So I was trying to basically 
I started to be comfortable even in being uncomfortable. Mm. So I was going through all these different ailments from having opiate pills, and then I started to just pop them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, then I started to just be like, you know what, maybe this is just what I'm supposed to do. Maybe I'm not supposed to be this person that can lay hands on the sick and they should recover. And I started to belittle who I was. And my father asking me to preach was basically like, dude, you can be healed any moment that you want to. You just need to just get your butt up. And that's the whole thing about taking action, about stepping out. So, you know, he would ask me every single week, hey, you preaching on Sunday? You preaching on Sunday? I'm like, dude, if you ask me <laughs> one more time to preach, I'm not getting up out of this bed. Even me and my wife was going at it a couple of times during this period because, you know, I'm, like, just a nasty person, man, during this time period. I'm, like, mad at God. Like, why am I laying on this bed when I have so much responsibility to do? But God probably the whole time was like, why are you laying on this bed when yeah. you have such yeah. a big yeah. responsibility to do? So take up your bed. You take up your bed yeah. and walk. Wow, wow. So as soon as, as soon as I finally started to get it, like, would you stop annoying me, asking me to come preach? I can't even get out of bed, dude. And finally, one Saturday, I was like, fine. I'll go preach at our other location. And then I'll come right back home and go to bed because you asking me way too many times. So I get there that Sunday. Um, this is after like seven weeks after the, the, uh, the accident. I get there. I was gonna sit down in the pew. I sit down in, in, in a chair just like me and you, and just open up my Bible and just say what I knew. Mm. Wow. You know what I'm saying? And in my thought process, now looking at it, that would be robbing the people of anything that they needed from God. And that's why us as people, we can't just wake up not talking to God because. God gets fresh bread every single morning. He can give you fresh wisdom anytime that you need it. All he says is just ask of me. So in this moment, man, I'm just, I get there, but my uh, my brother who leads praise and worship for the ministries, he started to lead praise and worship and as uh, the song was, You Are My Daily Bread. And God gave me exactly what I needed. A person who couldn't really lift their hands over seven weeks, I couldn't really lift this arm up. Then my arm started to do this. First, it started like right here, started to do this, and then like total surrender in that moment. Um, it was crazy because I, I had went through so many different emotions. God, you don't really care about me. How could this happen to me? And this is just an accident, but this is a freak accident where I'm like on my vacation. And then I can't move, but then I can't do anything. And then I, you know, was basically drugged up and medicated for the seven weeks. It just like, started to like the medic, the drug. Yeah, started the to like the drug and medication yeah, yeah, because, because it just it keeps me, yeah. kept, keeps me just, you know, yeah. at ease. Yeah. And uh, you know, started to look at the people like I got out. What I what I was about to say, what I knew, I couldn't do it. Anymore. Then I started to just. That was the longest that I, that I had got out of the chair, stood up, preached for like 40 minutes. That was the longest that I had stood since the accident. Um, so my body was just tired and drained. I mean, it was a move of God in that message, in that house. It's, it was just, you know, that's what happens when you surrender, right? Yeah, yeah. God can do anything he wants to do. And uh, that, that moment taught me that, hey, you can get anything you want out of me. That's what God is saying to me. Like, you can get anything you want out of me. But soft anything, that ain't gonna do it. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 you gotta, you gotta put some faith towards whatever it is that you move forward to. So, um, at that moment, I was like, "All right, I did my work today. I'm about to go home. I'm tired. I'm drained. As long as I've been stood." And uh, one of the deacons was driving me, and it's like. And that as I get in the car, I'm like, you know what? Just take me to main campus. I can go in my office and sleep. And then my wife can drive, drive me back home. Being set up, didn't even know it. Being set up, <laughs> didn't even know it. Mm -hmm. I get to main campus. I, I 
service hadn't started yet, so I was like, let me just sit in this back pew real quickly. I, I, don't, I don't really have the energy to go upstairs. Being set up the whole way, right? All these, I'm back there, I start to pray, and I hear this voice. I'm not done with you yet, son. I'm like, what in the world? I'm not done with you yet. I said, I said you talk, I said, somebody back there, I said, you, somebody, there was like nobody around. I'm like, so I was like, I'm tripping right now. I'm, I probably need some more medication. <laughs> <laughs> Start praying again. I'm not done with you yet. And I, I responded, I said, what you mean you're not done with me? need you to preach. I said, God kind of slow today. I've, I've already preached today. God has used me. This thing is done. Then I saw service had started, hit my, my dad's notes. My dad was preaching that Sunday, so the, his notes had hit the, hit the uh, soundboard uh, for the media team to put on the screens. And uh, I'm like, okay, we're good. He preaching. Mm -hmm. But Usually my dad is down pretty early during praise and worship. You know, he, you know we want to be a part of the praise and worship experience. Um, and he, was take, he wasn't coming down. So I'm dealing with this thought in my head the whole time that, God, you say you're not done with me. And then I said to myself, oh, well, he probably wants me to tell, God, you want me to tell what happened this morning. Uh, give you a testimony. Give you a testimony, <laughs> right? You want me to just give a testimony. Nah, Doc. <laughs> I want you to preach. So probably like my dad, 10 minutes later, comes down and uh, he's like, I'm going to do the offering today. Hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, why is he telling me that? Because, oh yeah, no, you usually do the offering. So you're getting a break. I'm getting a break. Mm -hmm. But what comes out of my mouth next, I don't even know how it came out. I said, that's okay because I'm going to preach today. Wow. Now my dad is already mic'd up like us. I already got his lab on, through his shirt, through through the back ties, you know, through we put ours through the tie, you know, all nice and stuff. And that comes out of my mouth. Wow. My dad immediately does not say, he says, You sure? I said, yes. He takes off his mic right there in the back, takes it off. Go get it. Wow. Now that's that says something to me, right? That says something to me that God probably was not just speaking to me. That's trust in the Holy Spirit in that moment. Because why would you give somebody the mic mm -hmm. that... Right, you didn't know they was prepared or not. You don't know if they're prepared or not. Mm -hmm. Preached an hour. So you prayed, prayed, prayed for a hundred and about 20 people that day. Miracle signs and wonders in the name of the message, step out. Wow. Which birthed the book that we Which now birthed have. the book. I was limping as I got up here because I still wasn't, I still hadn't received in my mind my healing. The manifestation of it wasn't there. So I'm still like barely limping up here. As the service was going on, my body was healed as the service. So by the time I got to start praying for people, I was basically running from one side to the next. You forgot all about the injury. Wow. That's what, that's what I'm saying. Sometimes we isolate what God can do with us because of our experience, of what our past has taught us, what others have taught us, and what we are experiencing in that moment. Mm -hmm. it, it's so funny because if you had not, I'm just thinking, yeah. if you had not accepted that call in that moment, yeah. I wouldn't be able to see God's hand in my life. Wow. And you wouldn't have been elevated to this next level because no. that's when the, your first book. Now, so now you so, got so, so I preach the message. Uh -huh. As I'm walking out of here that day, I get up to my office and God's like, it's time to write it. Other people need to be encouraged that what they're going through is not the destination that I have for them. It's part of the journey. But just like if you get on the road, you know, and, and you know, you start going, driving to Ohio, drive from here to Kentucky. There's some rest stops along the way. That means that I, that Sunday morning was a refilling for me. 
and other people are on their journey, they've got a couple more miles to their destination. But while before they get there, they're gonna feel restless. They're gonna feel tired. They're gonna feel like they're not gonna make it to that rest stop. They're not gonna make it to that next point that I've called them to go. They're not gonna, they're not gonna make it, they feel like they're not gonna make that dream happen that I've given them, that vision, that business that I've laid out for them. They're not gonna, they feel they have this feeling, but yet I have called them to step out on faith so that we can see this thing through. And so um, I was obedient. Yeah. Rode in like two weeks. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's just amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just and then, So now, okay. through an accident, <laughs> I you wrote know. my first book. Right, you know? right. Now, so, so now you're not, you're not just preacher, yeah. entrepreneur, you're author. Now I'm an author so because now, of the whole experience. Wow. And, and uh, now, really, I'm uh, editing my playbook mm. for Step Out. Wow. So um, this will be my second. Wow. So Amazing. hopefully in the next couple of months, that'll be out. So God is, he's tremendous, man. Amen. I mean, no yeah. doubt. We're gonna to begin to wrap, but I, okay. I want to I want to um, take a moment because you guys, you and your brother, are serving as pastors mm -hmm. now here alongside your uh, father. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, being the millennials mm -hmm. in the house, yeah. what new perspectives? What do you feel like the body of Christ needs in order to win this generation now? No different. No different. Same message. Okay. It could be true, or it could be retooled a different way. Same message. Okay. He died. He was buried. He rose again. It's been winning people ever since the beginning of time. I mean, since he, since since the resurrection. I think what happens though is that we think that it's so many different other things to win people. Now, to disciple people is a whole different ball game. But to win souls, it's just spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ and allowing that love to be shown. Um, he tells. I think one of the things that is hurting us is we have a problem loving people. And it's the first command. You know, he says that <laughs> if you really want to know how all the other commandments are told, love others as you would love yourself. And I think we have compartmentalized Christians, denominations, and, and where we feel like we're all after something totally different um, when all is man-made anyway, but... Uh, if we just follow the message of Christ and, and sharing the gospel, when I share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody on the street, they receive. So what's the difference? Yeah. The difference is we're talking about every single thing, but mm. you're caught up in the hype. Caught up in the hype of yeah. this and that, and but when people are hurting and young people are really needing direction, we can talk about you know why you know from family issues of them not being a father in the house of you know they're not being the whole family of kids growing up having to deal with various different issues whether it's an educational system and all these different things but the one thing that this nation needs is just god and i think that that's the one missing part of it people are like well there's so many churches but there's a lot of of us getting we get off the path of evangelizing, saying that, hey, people need Jesus. Some of the reasons why we're experiencing what we're experiencing. Because um, I know when I truly accepted him in my life, my life started to change. And that's my testimony. Um, but every single time in my life that I've got off the beaten path, it wasn't because, you know, God wasn't doing something for me. It's because my flesh, I gave into that part. Um, so uh, Jesus is amazing. And I think that the more that we realize and sharing the true nature of who Jesus is, not church itself, not a building itself, but relationship with Jesus, not a religion, but relationship and what that relationship has done for us. When we share that in a true, authentic form, I know that he has transformed my life like never before. My friends that grew up with me, they call me John 2.0 right now. <laughs> Because the 1.0 version, they knew that that 1.0 was a mess. This 2.0 is revamped, and it ain't because of me. It's because I submitted to God's plan for my life. Looking at this uh, sanctuary, this building, uh, this ministry mm -hmm. that you and your dad and uh, mom built, they're 40 years in now. Yeah. Um, thinking about your own ministry and what God yeah. is doing for you, what do you want for yourself 40 years from now? Uh, me and my brother say that it's not to change the vision but just to continue to run with it. I think that uh, what he says unto one, he says unto all. We're part of that lineage. What he said unto my dad of reaching the city, nation, and the world for Jesus Christ, we're just going to follow through with that and um, continue to spread God. 
all across the world in any medium as possible. So that's that's the plan that we have is is any way that we can see that we can fit any of those needs being met. Um, so uh, from the city aspect of making sure that we do all that we can given the city resources, the people that are in the city. Um, lately we've done expungement fairs here, um, health things here, um, anything dealing with uh, body, mind, soul, spirit, we're gonna be a part of it. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. Well, my brother, I appreciate Thanks, you. Thank through. you for joining appreciate me. Appreciate it, man. Uh, you have my support. Tell us how we can get the book. Oh, you can get the book a lot of different ways, but uh, come check me out at jonathanamerit.com. JonathanAmerit.com. The reason why I'm putting the A in between there, obviously that's my father's name is Andrew, stands for that, uh, but also because there's another Jonathan Merritt who is the author of that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we want to make sure that you get to the right place. So JonathanAmerit.com, um, they can pick up the uh, book there. I also did an a, a audio, uh, audible version, so uh, they can pick that on uh, iTunes or Amazon as well. Wow. No. Well, you have it here. This has been the Build On Beauty Podcast, where beauty is born skin deep. I'm your host, Cornell Tremaine. Until next time, let your soul be made whole. Take care.